a second. There we go. Okay. All right. Um, and I'm going to introduce the uh, our four college visitors uh, first, uh, very briefly. And um, maybe uh, when I say your name, you guys can um, just say hi and maybe say how long you've been uh, at your current institution, just so we can check to make sure that audio is working for everyone. Uh, so we have here tonight Gladys Cortez from St. Olaf College in Northfield, Minnesota. Hi everyone, this is gonna be my second year at the college and I am excited to be here tonight. Thank you for having me. Thank you, thank you for coming. Uh, we got Benjamin Bousquet from Grinnell College in Grinnell, Iowa. Hi everyone, my name's Ben and I've been uh, working here for about three months or so. All right. Great, two months, well, trial by fire, I guess, huh? <laughs> uh, we have Jennifer Tanner here from St. Louis University and I bet you can figure out where St. Louis University is. Hi everyone, yes, it is in St. Louis as the name suggests. Um, I have been with SLU for just about five years. All right, great, thank you. Yeah, and she's been to Seabury several times. Thank you. Um, and we have Keith Stanford here from Tulane University. Good evening, everyone. And I am a super senior, so this is my fifth year with Tulane University. All right, yeah. And I think I've, I've, no, I've definitely known Keith the longest here. I think our acquaintance goes back to maybe like 2006, 2007, something like that. Yeah. So he's, uh, he's, he's a pro, I'm telling you. Okay, um, our co-host tonight will be seniors Audrey Wen Wong and Lyle Griggs. And I am basically going to let them run things from here on out. I can help you guys monitor the chat. And um, do I need to officially make you co-hosts or, or is, that, is that necessary? I can do it. Do you think it's necessary? I don't think you need to. I don't think I need to. Yeah, we're keeping it simple tonight. So, okay, uh, Lyle and Audrey, I'm turning it over to you. Okay. All right. Audrey, you want to start? Sure. Um, first off, we're just going to start with like describing the Seabury like community specifically so you can address like the kind of body that you know how. Um, so basically Seabury is a smaller school. We're in Lawrence, Kansas, but we're really big on community values and academics. We do have a strong athletic program, but I think most of the students at the school are here mainly to focus on academics. And I'm pretty sure every member of the senior class plans on going to college post this. So then that's kind of the audience you're orienting to. Lyle, do you wanna add anything? Sure, I think that one thing that makes Seabury uh, unique or at least something that you, you might wanna note as college reps is that because we're a small school with small class sizes that often affects where people want to go and what they want to see in a college. So either they like small class sizes and like small schools and want that small environment, or sometimes there's a, you know, the opposite reaction and they want, you know, large group exposure with a ton of people. Um, so usually one way or another people react to the fact that it's a, it's a small school, a very tight knit community. Either they want that or they want something different. So that's something to keep in mind. Um, I guess I, at, at, at this point, if anyone else, for example, teachers who I'm sure have much more experience selling the school want to add some things, you can go ahead. All right. Oh, I will note that Seabury doesn't have like AP courses since we're oriented on our own honor schedule, but most of the class level at Seabury are like honors levels classes. Okay. All so right. then we'll just pass it on to whoever wants, does anyone want to start off to talk about your college? Who wants the first? Sure, I'm happy to go first. I don't want to call anyone out. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I'll start. Uh, as I said, my name is Ben and I represent Grinnell. Uh, Grinnell is a small liberal arts college of around 1700 students located in Grinnell, Iowa, which is about an hour uh, from both Des Moines and Iowa City and four hours from a bunch of other cities like Kansas City, um, St. Louis, Chicago, places like that. Um, I know three, I think one thing that can be hard with liberal arts colleges is kind of differentiating them. So I think um, there are three main things I like to talk about that make Grinnell unique. Uh, the first of those is that we have what's called self-governance here at Grinnell, which means that students 
have a really great role in kind of overseeing the way the college works. So uh, for instance, our students get to oversee over $450,000 that they can allocate uh, to all sorts of different clubs and events, bringing speakers to campus, to musical acts. Um, so I think it's a really great experience for students to actually have that power to be able to bring who and what they want to campus. Uh, on top of that, we also have what we call our individually advised curriculum, which uh, manifests in a basically open curriculum. Uh, we have one class that all students are required to take, which is our first year tutorial. It's a reading and writing intensive class you'll take in your first year. But even with that class, there's 20 to 30 different options available for students. So um, some ones we've had in past years range everything from uh, Janelle Manet and Afrofuturism all the way to the Lord of the Rings. But other than that, it's a completely open curriculum. And you have a variety of advisors ranging from your academic advisor to your career exploratory advisor uh, to your residential advisor to really make sure that all of our students can take as best advantage of um, that open curriculum as possible and get that breadth of a liberal arts education. Um, I think the last thing that I really like to plug as being pretty unique to Grinnell in my mind is um, probably the hardest to define and that's that there's a real purposefulness I think behind students who choose to go to Grinnell. Um, it's not a school that students just kind of stumble upon since we are located in a little bit of an out-of-the-way location. Uh, so it really allows students to say that this is a school that they want to be a part, this is a community that they want to be a part and actively add and build to that community. Um, so especially being new to Grinnell, I think that's something that has really kind of um, come to the forefront of what I've realized about, you know, the students, the faculty, the staff here, is that they all actively really want to be here and a part of this community. So um, that's my very quick, what makes Grinnell unique. Thanks. Great, who wants to go next? <laughs> I can go next and kind of hop on the liberal arts train there. So hi everyone, my name is Goddess. Um, as Matt you know, introduced me earlier, I work with St. Olaf. So St. Olaf is a small private liberal arts college about 45 minutes south of Minneapolis and St. Paul. Um, or if we think about it the other way, we're about an hour north of Rochester, if any of you are familiar with Minnesota at all. Um, what the liberal arts means for us is, again, having a really interdisciplinary education. Um, about a third of our students double major. So it's definitely the place where if you have multiple passions, you won't have to sacrifice one over another. Um, our average class size is reported at a 23, but I'll explain why that's a little bit of a misconception. So our intro to classes might, you know, run towards even 30 students, which kind of gets, at least in my eyes, a larger class feel. But um, another way I'd like to think about our class size is that 60% of our classes have less than 20 students. So 15, 17 is I think more of a true median um, for what you would encounter here. Um, but overall, um, really what our college really values is having that, you know, purposefully and intentionally residential experience um, that's also really engaged in community. So Audrey, when you were talking about that, that really kind of caught my ear. Um, as a college, I think we are continuously like growing, changing, um, and we're diverse in our values. Um, so we are obviously always striving to be more inclusive, and that's a certain conversation that's actually really important on our campus right now. Um, so we are at 22% domestic students of color and 10% international students. Um, I think out of one of the, I guess one of the key characteristics is how much our students want to prepare while they're at St. Olaf, but after St. Olaf as well. So about 92% of our students participate in some form of internship or summer job or research opportunity. Um, and so that kind of being another factor to engaging both in and out of the classroom. Um, our Piper Center for Vocation and Career, which is essentially our career center, is kind of really that key factor that makes sure that students you know, are thinking about um, where they want to be and what the passion they want to pursue after their four years here. Um, so we have over $500,000 that are awarded annually for internships. Every student has $2, a $2,000 scholarship grant um, or scholarship or grant that is given to them for any internship that might be not funded or underfunded. Um, just to make sure that you have, you can have these experiences without having to worry about cost. Um, well, let's see, what other things can I mention? Right, so um, we are affiliated with the ELCA, so that's the Evangelical Lutheran Church of America. I think having a religious affiliation really adds a different element to the experience here. So 
It's not by any means like the majority of our students. I think for this last year, about 18% of our students identify as Lutheran, but the counterpart of that would be that 40% identify as having no religious affiliation. So I think that kind of really provides a little bit of a lay of the land in terms of the diversity of faith and values or the diversity of values really at our college. Um, we're not a place where it's an echo chamber. So we have students that have are all over the spectrum in terms of um, what their interests are, but I guess what their personal identities are as well. Um, one thing that I always like to emphasize about St. Olaf is just don't, you know, don't be scared about the cost. Um, we are a school that meets 100% of demonstrated need. So while you would see on our website that we are at about um, $65,000 a year, our financial aid package is a 45, our average financial aid package is $45,000 a year. So it's about 20,000, you know, a $20,000 difference between those two. Um, but if you have questions, I'm excited to answer your questions. So I will stop talking there. I'm sorry that was so lightning fast, but thank you all. Thank you. Okay, I think we're gonna keep rolling with this volunteer <laughs> process. Does anyone else wanna go next? Sure, I'll go. Okay. My name is Keith Stanford, and I have the honor of serving for, um, as the Director of Midwest Recruitment for Tulane University, which is a private mid-sized research university in the great city of New Orleans. No offense to Lawrence, Kansas, but <laughs> the city of New Orleans, as you probably realize, is one of the oldest cities in the country, over 300 years old. And, um, you know, we've got a lot of festivals, and I'll talk a little bit more about that. But in that description, we're a private mid-sized research university. So we're private. We're going to cost a little bit more than your typical state university, but we'll uh, be able to offer plenty of merit scholarships and financial assistance to make you um, able to, to afford that. We're mid-sized, so we're less than 8,000 students with an eight to one student faculty ratio on the average class size between 22 to 24 students. The largest class we had on campus last year, probably about 135 students, but even in those classrooms, you're still an individual in the classrooms and you're expected to show up for class time to not only take information, but to also be able to add your perspective to the classrooms is as well. We're a tier one research university. Um, so we're among the top 2% of the universities in the country. So there's more research happening across the entire academic curriculum um, at a place like Tulane. Um, in fact, we receive close to $200 million to support research um, across all of the academic disciplines for research. So if you're taking notes, you probably want to take some notes right now. So um, Tulane, the cornerstone to our educational approach is freedom and flexibility, freedom and flexibility across the entire academic curriculum. We actually have five schools that make up the undergraduate university. So we have a school of architecture, school of business, school of liberal arts, school of public health, and then finally, we have a school of science and engineering. And unlike all of the other schools that may have, I'm sorry, any other university that may have multiple schools in the context of that university, instead of you applying separately to one of our schools, when you apply for admission, and when you're admitted, you are admitted to all five of our schools. So the beauty in that, if you have multiple interests, we embrace it. We want you to actually pursue all of your interests. In fact, one of my students, I always like to share, you know, an anecdote about one or two of my students. One of my students, Ryan Braun, and if you're actually a baseball fan, not to be confused with the Milwaukee Brewers, Ryan Braun. Ryan Braun, my student who I actually recruited, he's actually triple majoring in biochemistry, history, and Spanish. Talk about someone who takes full advantage of the flexibility of our curriculum. He's actually pre-med, so he actually obviously wants to major in science, so that's biochemistry, and he also loves history, and he also loves Spanish. So he's triple majoring. So if you're interested in multiple, or, or majoring in multiple disciplines, you can do that at Tulane. I wanna talk about two professors though, two professors that I'm hopeful that you'll actually maybe walk away hearing my presentation knowing and actually wanting to do, do a little research. These two novels, were written by the only female author in this country to win the National Book of the Year Award twice. Jasmine Ward, she teaches in our English department. So if you actually wanna have an opportunity to take a great class with the Jasmine Ward, look no further than Tulane University. And I'm gonna try not to get too political when I say this, but especially given the fact that democracy is not just something that is fleeting, in this country. The author of Ben Franklin's biography is actually Walter Isaacson. 
Walter Isaacson, one of the most prolific authors of biographies. And in fact, I'm actually reading Leonardo da Vinci's biography right now by Walter Isaacson. By the way, he also wrote Steve Jobs' biography as well. Teaches in our history department. So if you want to be taught by full-time faculty members in all of the classes that you take instead of actually TAs or graduate students, that's what's going to happen at Tulane. And one final piece that I kind of want to talk a little bit about, actually, too, um, you know, there's a lot of great things that you're actually going to be able to inherit from the city of New Orleans. Not only, yes, we do have Mardi Gras, we've got the Jazz Fest, we've got, you know, uh, festivals that celebrate food, celebrate music. But beyond all those great things that you're going to inherit from the city of New Orleans, Tulane did something about 15 years ago that no other research university had done prior. And that was to integrate public service to the core of its curriculum. So all of our students have an opportunity to come to campus and not only simply enjoy the city of New Orleans and take away from the culture and actually just enjoy all the great food, great cuisine and the great music. Our students have an opportunity to impact the lives of others. So there are two tiers, tier one, tier two. Tier one, our students have an opportunity in the first two years to take classes with the Jesmyn Ward and maybe that English class. You have an opportunity to go into a local middle school. And at that middle school, not only will you have an opportunity to be able to mentor and to tutor that student, be able to apply what you've learned from one of those classes that you have taught by Jesmyn Ward, you have an opportunity to impact the lives of members of your own community. During the junior and senior year, now you have an opportunity to impact the lives of others through either an internship or a service project that you have a hand in helping to create. And one example I always enjoy sharing comes from the School of Architecture. The students in the School of Architecture every year have an opportunity to design a home. The winning design is gonna be built from start to finish. And those students not only have an opportunity to have this great new item on their resume to say, hey, I designed and I oversaw the building of a new home. They now have an opportunity to be able to go into a local neighborhood in the city of New Orleans, meet the residents of that neighborhood, learn about the life experiences and the life perspectives, the challenges of that neighborhood. And in turn, our students have an opportunity to be able to share their life experiences, their Tulane experiences, so that we learn how we are more connected as a community than not. So Tulane graduates great successful architects, great successful business leaders, great successful historians, great successful public health officials that we so desperately need in charge now. Um, and additionally, great scientists or, or physicians as well. But beyond all those great professionals, Tulane ensures that it graduates great individuals who understand that they can have an impact on the communities that they reside. And that's the most important aspect and element to the Tulane experience that I enjoy most, that we're actually graduating great people with integrity and integrity. And in 2020, you would never think that integrity is something that we actually have to question in our daily lives. We want, to we want to ensure that we are graduating great people who will go out and serve the rest of the world rather than serving themselves. Thank you. All right, thank you. Uh, we still have one more. Yes. Yeah, okay. Last but not least. <laughs> Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Jennifer Tanner. I am a regional admission counselor for St. Louis University. So I am actually based in Kansas City, so not too far from Lawrence. Um, this is very weird for me to say, but I think that SLU is the largest school in this room, which is probably a first for me. We are about 8,000 undergraduate students, 13,000 with graduate. Um, so that does make us the largest, but in any other context, we are solidly a medium-sized university. Um, SLU is a Jesuit institution, and I want to spend some time talking about that because being a Jesuit university is really at the core of everything uh, that we do and how we review students and how our students interact on campus. If you're not familiar with the Jesuits, they are one of the largest orders of Catholic priests founded in the early 1500s by St. Ignatius of Loyola. And their mission has 
always been education of the whole person through mind, body, and spirit. So a well-rounded education is really at the forefront at SLU. Uh, regardless of what you study, whether it be physical therapy, uh, engineering, uh, psychology, you will still take those liberal arts classes. You'll take a philosophy class, theology, English history. We want you to know a little bit about everything when you graduate. Uh, another part of being a Jesuit university is this idea of being men and women with and for others, especially at SLU. Service is really important to who we are. Uh, if you were walking around campus, you'd be hard pressed to find a student who hasn't done service at least once during their time here. In fact, uh, a couple of years ago in 2018, which was our bicentennial as we were founded in 1818, our faculty, staff, students, the SLU community completed just under 2 million hours of service within the year. Uh, it's not normally something we track with that intensity, but uh, with that year, we really wanted to put that at the forefront of what SLU is all about. While we are a Catholic institution, you do not need to be religious to attend SLU by any means. We, when I say that we are Jesuit, the Jesuits, it was really more about how we educate our students than the religion that goes behind it. If you have a faith life, great. There are ways for you to get involved with that at SLU, but if that's not something you're looking for, it's not something that needs to be a part of your experience. We are in the city of St. Louis, so we are an urban campus by definition. We're in the Midtown neighborhood, which is the Arts District, if any of you have taken a venture over to St. Louis at any point in time. Um, but still very much that traditional campus. So there's only one main road that goes through campus. Other than that, we're essentially one long rectangle. So you're not wandering city blocks looking for our buildings. You can easily see them. What I love about SLU is we're always doing something new. We just opened a new interdisciplinary science and engineering building. And then about a mile down the road, uh, SLU Hospital 2.0, which is what I am referring to it as, just opened about a month ago. So we are a level one trauma center for anyone who is thinking medicine. We are in the middle of the city. So you get to see a whole wide variety of populations at our hospital. And that's where a lot of our students who are involved in the health sciences, whether that be nursing, physical therapy, occupational therapy, our students on the pre-medicine track, they get a lot of hands-on experience at SLU Hospital as well as the pediatric hospital that is right across the street. Lots of hospitals right by SLU. One of the things that makes us unique is the Billiken. Now, if you have no idea what a Billiken is, that's okay, I don't blame you. So the Billiken is our mascot, and I would share my screen with you if I could. Uh, but the Billiken is a symbol of good luck. It was designed in the early 1900s, became a fad at the time. And the only reason it became associated with SLU is we had a football coach named John Bender, and everyone decided that he resembled the Billiken. So they started calling the team Bender's Billikens. Uh, Google a picture of Billiken and you'll see that it wasn't really a compliment, but they started referring to the team as, uh, as Bender's Billikens. As I said, thank you, Matt. <laughs> Matt is holding up a picture of the Billiken. I appreciate you. Yeah, I guess I could have. I could have held up my little squishy billiken that I've got right here. Um, so we don't, no longer have football, but the name did stick and it is still a symbol of good luck on our campus. Another thing of note is that we do have a second campus in Madrid, Spain. So you can spend all four years at SLU and receive a degree from us without ever stepping foot in St. Louis. Um, a more popular option is studying abroad and we send about 300 students a semester to our campus in Madrid. And then finally, the really the other thing that I want to mention is the kind of opportunities that you will have at SLU. Like Tulane, we are a tier one research institution. So that means there's always some form of research going on uh, both at the student level and at the faculty level. You can get involved in research as early as freshman or sophomore year. And because we are also doctoral extensive, you can carry that all the way through to the PhD level if you really felt like it. Research is not a requirement, so don't feel like you have to do that, but not every institution is going to offer you that opportunity to get involved in research at such an early level. If you do have any questions, we all of us are going to be here for at least another 30 minutes, so you are welcome to toss them at us, but I'll toss it back to our host for the next section. Okay, so 
Lila are going to ask the panel some questions that we have from earlier. I think we're going to start off with, um, for every representative, what do you feel is students need to know when deciding between a smaller liberal arts college and a larger university? I can go ahead and kick us off. Um, just briefly, I, a lot of it has to do with your comfort level of what experience you want. So, I mean, I would say none of us are large institutions, so you're going to get a pretty personalized experience at all of our schools, even though we range from a couple thousand to 8,000. Um, so it's really a matter of if you want to know every single person that you walk past on campus as you go throughout your four years, if you are like, yes, I want to know everyone, I want to recognize those faces, or if you want to go through all four years with the opportunity to always be meeting someone new is probably the easiest way to describe it. None is better or worse. It's just different on what kind of experience you're looking for. Yeah, I would definitely agree with that from the liberal arts side in that I think size is probably the biggest difference between a liberal arts college and a larger university. Um, I think, you know, there are, there are definitely, as Jennifer said, pros and cons to both, whereas in, in a, a larger university, as she said, there's, there's room to meet new people every day, there's room for an, anonymity if you want that, and in a liberal arts college, I think you're really forced in a really great and positive way to, to get to know every single person you meet. Um, if you miss class one day, your professor is going to email you um, because they're going to realize that you're not there and they want to make sure that everything is okay. And um, I didn't go to Grinnell, but I went to another liberal arts college. And I think it just really adds to the sense of community in the sense that every single person wants to A, make sure that you're doing well, you know, mentally, physically, whatever it might be, but also to make sure that they can academically help you in whatever way they can. And the professors come to liberal arts colleges because they actively want to be teaching and supporting undergraduates. The whole idea of the college search is to be selfish um, and identify the place that's going to give you everything that you're looking for in a college experience. And, um, you know, I used to work for my alma mater, which is a very small liberal arts university in a very, very small town. And I absolutely loved it. It was uh, an incredibly um, amazing experience for me. And, and um, I managed to recruit some fantastic students. In fact, one of my former students, Gus Wigan Takalino from Bishop Seabury, I actually recruited from um, Bishop Seabury. Um, and it was actually a good fit for, 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 for Gus. But the whole idea of a college search um, is to identify a place that you know that you're gonna grow in so many different areas. It's not only in the classrooms um, that you're gonna grow intellectually, you're gonna grow intellectually by the people that you meet um, and the interactions that you have um, outside the classrooms, whether or not it's on campus or if you're gonna study abroad. But a liberal arts experience can be a great experience, but it's gotta be the right fit for you. So the whole idea of this whole college search is identifying the place that's gonna be the, the best fit. And whether or not that is a liberal arts college or maybe a, a much larger university, you have to really figure it out for yourself whether or not you actually want a liberal arts environment or if you choose to go to a much larger university that may have a liberal arts component, but just choose the best fit that's going to represent what you're looking for in a four-year college experience. Absolutely. I really couldn't have said any of that better. So I, way to go, everyone else. But um, probably the only thing I'll mention is just in terms of the difference in size, like you can attend a, a small liberal arts college and still not meet everyone on the campus. You know, I attended a school that is it's about 2,000 students, which so is a little smaller than Sino Love, a little bigger than Grinnell. And I can absolutely say I did not meet everyone. So um, just keep that in mind, I think, in terms of while it's small, you'll still, and regardless for any size that you're looking for, that community and that experience that you're looking for, you'll find. Um, just be mindful of kind of like the structure of the college and um, or university that you're looking at um, to see what the other components of your experience, as I think Keith said, like the personal, I mean, and Jennifer even said, like, you're, like, if you have a spiritual or faith-based, all of these components, kind of how they're present in a college, how they're present in the physical environment, the atmosphere of the location, all of that kind of being influential to, um, a, you know, the difference between a small and, and a larger institution. All right. Thank you, guys. Uh, 
first first of all, as far as size goes, um, one thing to keep in mind is that even Grinnell, which is the small, I think the smallest of these colleges, is huge when compared to Bishop Seabury. Uh, it's like 10 times as big. So uh, it's a, only a slight exaggeration. So there's still, you know, there's still a lot more people than what we're used to. Uh, all right, anyway, um, the next question is more specific to the application process and how it's been affected by COVID-19. Um, so my question is, should students apply test optional to your colleges? I believe that that's an option at all these places. Correct me if I'm wrong. That's the first thing I was going to say. Make sure the college that you're looking at has a test optional policy. So I can speak for St. Olaf. Um, test optional is something that we have been having many conversations about for several years at this point. Um, and thankfully, this year was kind of the tipping point where we could make it happen. Um, and so really the goal for us is in having that test optional policy is to make sure that there are, we are removing bar barriers rather than creating barriers. So in thinking about that, um, you, you know, for us, you don't have to submit a test score to be considered for any of our merit scholarships. Um, we want students to feel empowered to decide and, you know, make that decision for yourself. Um, if you think that your test score is a representation of your academic performance and you think it reflects well on how you did and you're very proud of it, absolutely submit it. Um, if you're nervous about it or I understand, you know, a lot of you I bet had test even back in the spring that you weren't able to take. Um, if it's something that isn't representative of you, don't include it. Um, and if you change your mind, if you submit it and change your mind, just let your admissions officer know and you can, you, you know, we're there to support you. So keep that in mind, especially as this year continues. Um, we understand and want to be sensitive to all the challenges you're facing. Um, but removing that barrier was one way in, in, in which um, we're trying to help out rather than to hurt your application. So that's not something you have to be worried about. Um, for St. Olaf. Yeah, and I'll just echo everything that Gladys said. I think everything she said also applies to Grinnell in that um, we're really excited to be test optional this year, especially considering we know that this is a tricky year for everyone across the country, across the world. And we want this to be as equitable and accessible of a process as possible. Um, I think the one thing that I would just add to what Gladys said is that I, I know like when I was a student and I was looking at schools that were test optional, I was like, oh, like how test optional is this school actually? And, and the thing I, I heard when I was a student that really made me realize that test optional is, is just as valid of an option as submitting test scores for schools that are test optional. Um, it, it was put to me where if a school really wanted your test scores, they would just ask for them. They're not gonna spend all night, you know, staying up and thinking about what your test scores actually are. Um, that would just be totally counterproductive so that um, when we say test optional, we absolutely mean test optional and like Gladys, all of our merit scholarships and everything like that also apply to test optional students. So really it's all about finding that right fit for you in the application process. If you think your test scores reflect who you are as a student, by all means submit them. But um, if for one reason or another, and that can be a personal reason or maybe a testing site reason or whatever it might be, don't feel pressured to submit test scores. The only other thing I'll add, SLU is also test optional this year, and my philosophy is if you haven't already taken a test, don't worry about it, or if you like took it once this sophomore just for fun, and then you were like, oh, this is now my only test score, don't feel like you need to submit it. Um, but I think this year more than ever, really pay attention to what the university is saying. Test optional means four different things at each of each of these four different universities. I can I can guarantee you not in a good or a bad way is they're just different. Um, some schools may be test blind, which is where you don't need it. They won't look at any test scores ever. And I'm sure Matt is going to has done or will do a great job of explaining the differences between all of those. But that is where people like the four of us that are here tonight really come into play is it's so important to reach out to us. If you're looking at a website and you're like, I can't find this information, I don't know, just find your admission counselor at that school or say, what does test optional mean at your school? Or I'm applying to this specific program. Should I should submit this test score? You can tell us what your test score is before applying. We're not going to hold that against you for asking, but I can't guide you if I don't have all of the information. So just feel free to be transparent with us and know that we will be transparent back as well. Just recall holistic review. <laughs>
um, holistic review of the entire candidate, all the things that you're actually going to submit to, um, an, to an institution in your application um, will be taken into consideration. So if you do not want to submit um, a test score, um, you, are, you will still have all of the other elements to your application reviewed um, in order to be able to make an assessment of your ability not only to be successful in the classrooms, but to um, also um, to, to be able to earn admission to the institution. So um, test optional, don't feel weird um, about not submitting scores. Um, if the school says test optional, that's what it means. Okay, I'm gonna hop on a note that Gladys was talking about. You all were talking about how the like test optional is for the application in general. With COVID happening, are those is are scholarships and financial aid opportunities also test optional? It's a great question, Audrey. So for us. Um, the way that financial aid and, you know, scholarships work is that we have kind of two branches. So we have merit-based scholarships and we have need-based financial aid. Um, so merit scholarships you're automatically considered for, right? Um, you don't need, um, you know, test scores for that. The only application that we have for any of our merit scholarships is for our fine arts scholarships. So that's music, art, theater, or dance. And that's because our professors review those. Um, but for need-based financial aid, that's a completely separate process. So that takes place, you know, through the financial aid office um, and you just need like, to fill out your FAFSA and your CSS profile. Um, so separate processes, um, but you don't need a test score for either. So great question. Yep, and for Grinnell, it's basically all along the same lines. We also have two different types of aid. We have merit aid and we have need-based aid and neither of those do require um, any sort of test scores, the merit-based aid, um, like it sounds like uh, St. Olaf's is, um, it's just based off your application. There's no additional application needed for any of those. And those scholarships range from $10,000 to $25,000 a year. So it can be a great opportunity for students and uh, they're test optional this year since we aren't requiring test scores. Um, and need-based aid, same thing. You just need to submit um, your financial information. So your FAFSA and your CSS profile, um, and then you're considered for those and at Grinnell, um, we're need blind and pledged to meet 100% of need. So no test scores either way. All right, if, unless anyone else, I think this was sort of covered in the, in the last question for some people. Um, so hearing nothing else on that one. Um, the next one, this is a source of stress for people who are applying for, to colleges right now um, specifically essays the, and, the, and the personal statement on the Common App. So do you have any general advice for the, that main personal statement essay as well as any supplements, supplemental essays that are on your applications? Yes, I would love to take this first. Um, <laughs> be authentic, authentically yourself. Um, don't try to write about something that you don't really care about. Um, you know, I had a student actually write about stem cell research. Um, and didn't really, don't, don't go wrong. I mean, I'm not questioning whether or not, um, you know, some of the information that the student actually provided was, was accurate, but be true to yourself. You know, the whole idea of this whole college search is for you to grow as an individual. And by growing as, as an individual, it's accepting yourself as an individual, who you are. Um, not attempting to be someone else that you're not. One of the best personal statements I read over the past couple of years, and I read a lot of them, trust me, and I call them personal statements, just like you just said, it's a personal statement. It should reflect something personal of who you are and something that you actually enjoy talking about and you enjoy writing about. Probably one of the best personal statements I read came from a student who chronicled his life through music. Now, I happen to love music. In fact, I had my iPod. I'm very old school here. I have my iPod right here, and I'm always listening to music. And this young man actually chronicled moments in his life through song, whether or not he actually gave it, you know, one moment in his life, he gave it either a song title, maybe an album title, or maybe some lyrics. And during the course of my reading that personal statement, I was either, you know, popping my fingers along with some of the songs that I recognized and I was trying to sing along with, or I was actually singing along with some of the songs. And by the time that I finished reading that personal statement, you know, I, I was smiling. I had fun reading that personal statement. 
And what that told me about that student is I'm pretty sure that when he was sitting down to decide what he wanted to actually write about, he said, hey, what, what, what do I love? What, what, what do I actually enjoy talking about? And he came up with the idea of song. So when you actually write your personal statement, don't approach it by, you know, writing out, I gotta write another essay. Write it about something that you actually have a joy in talking about. And the admission representative who's going to read it is going to have that same reaction. They're gonna have joy, and I had joy. Trust me, I had joy in reading that personal statement. The supplemental essays, and Tulane actually has one as well, um, and, and our supplement is fairly simple. It's, you know, why? Why are you applying to the university? And, you know, often times or not students say, so what should I write? I mean, it's not like we're, it's not a magic formula. I mean, just write what is true to you. If you're really interested in the university, then you're actually going to write authentically what's going to come off of your heart. If you're applying to the university, really simply because you are interested in that university, it should be easy. It shouldn't actually be you trying to be someone that you're not, and you're actually trying to copy something from the website. Don't copy anything from the website. Write what comes from your heart. And that's the best advice that I can give you. Just be authentically yourself, and you'll actually be able to put together the best personal statement that you could ever, you could ever think of. Okay, so I think I'm going to ask the, which you touched on, which is kind of the inevitable question that all representatives get. Do you have, or can you like describe an ideal candidate for admission to your college? <laughs> all of us are. <laughs> I think we all look for something so different um, and some, I hate to get so nuanced here, but it really depends on what the selectivity of the school, um, if they are doing holistic review, if you're applying to a more specialized program, like for instance, at SLU, like our physical therapy, occupational therapy, and nursing programs are more competitive, and uh, so are our engineering majors. So it's hard to say that. I would say, of course, academics are what we're, we're looking at. So we're looking at your overall GPA. We're looking at the courses that you've taken and the rigor of the courses. So, and, you know, an, an ideal candidate is going to vary from major to major based on what kind of academic requirements they are looking for. Um, I think it, at all schools, especially these smaller universities and for liberal arts universities, to really speak to what Keith was saying is we're just, we're looking for students who are authentically themselves in whatever form that takes. So um, I would say it's really more about getting to know you and uh, seeing how you, seeing how we think you would be a good fit at our, at our institution. So, that's a really vague answer, but that's the, that's the best that I can do from my perspective. But anyone else is welcome to take a crack at it. Yeah, I think I would say that there's not an ideal student that we're looking for, but I think there are some overarching tr characteristics and traits of applications that we like to see. Um, Grinnell is a rigorous academic institution. So as Jennifer said, I think the number one thing is academics. We wanna make sure that you're challenging yourself uh, in the best possible way at your school and succeeding as best as possible because we really wanna take students who are going to thrive in an academic and rigorous environment. Um, but with that being said, I mean, other than that, we're looking for all sorts of different types of students. Um, we're looking for students who are involved, whether that's in their community, you know, volunteering, playing instruments in their band, uh, you know, creative writing or whatever it might be. Um, I think we want to see students who care about what they're doing and really can demonstrate that, you know, in their application, through their involvement, through their essay, and through ever what that might be. Um, but there's no one ideal student, I would say. I would say that probably just, and Jennifer mentioned this a little bit in terms of kind of what does it look like in specific to the context of our institution. Um, as a liberal arts college, I think I'm always looking for students that you know have some form of like intellectual curiosity or just personal curiosity to learn to understand um, and that's you know specifically someone who seeks to understand not only 
academia, but themselves and their peers. You know, I think that's a big part of our community, um, have, having this, you know, genuine um, desire to understand others and connect with others. And so very broadly, I think having that intellectual curiosity, excuse me, but um, that desire to connect with others and do so genuinely and meaningfully um, is something that I look for, which I think it's, it's very intangible, but it does come through your application when you're genuine. Um, don't feel like you have to write me the most perfect academic essay. My, the most memorable essay that I've read is like someone's holiday traditions and you know what they do with their families. It's again, I guess Keith said, whatever is meaningful to you, but that will you know, communicate um, those intangible characteristics that um, fit well with, you know, our students. And I'll only add just one other comment. Um, just be very intentional about the type of community that you are looking to join. You want that community to reflect the, you know, the, the, the values that you actually have for yourself and what you actually want, um, you know, the members of your, your, your student body to, to kind of represent. Um, fortunately, um, Tulane has um, an interview option this year. So fortunately, I've been able to, to interview a, a number of great, great students, with great credentials. Um, but I've been able to also help to guide a lot of students who are not good fits for the university. Um, for, for instance, Tulane's student body is, and you may hear this phrase, you know, used a thousand times over. But Tulane students are truly a collaborative group of people who are not competitive. They don't actually, you know, seek to find out, oh, I got a better grade than so-and-so in, you know, biochemistry or whatever. They, they don't actually enjoy that. They actually enjoy supporting one another. And I take my role as an admission representative very, very seriously. And I want to ensure that I'm continuing to actually not only share, you know, the message about the university, but I want to make sure that I'm helping to enroll type of students that are going to do well and thrive in our community. I don't want to actually enroll a student who ultimately is not going to enjoy the experience and then have to transfer. So one student I actually met with maybe a couple of weeks ago. She was so adamant. I love competing. I'm a competitive person. I love being the top student in my class. I love getting the hundred percent and watching my, my classmates, you know, just look in awe and wonder. And I told her, I said, you know what? You're, you're, you're so not the right fit for Tulane because our students, they don't thrive off of seeing someone else actually not do as well as you or, or, or fail. So know yourself true, truly and identify the community that's going to be supportive of what you want that community to look like. And that's the ideal student. All right, thank you. And then I think we, we're we gonna go to uh, Mr. Patterson, are you unmuting? I, I was just gonna say like, we might wanna do like, oh, open it up to question and answer pretty soon if you're not doing that already. Yeah, that's what I'm gonna do. Right. All right. Uh, yeah, so anyone who has questions for uh, anybody can raise their hand using that function and, and Audrey or I will call on you. All right, so any questions? I did receive a question in the chat for all the representatives to discuss their fine art departments and or like fine arts areas of study. I'll definitely jump in here. So I, I kind of mentioned it a little bit earlier, but um, the fine and performing arts are actually a big part of St. Olaf. We're not a conservatory, um, but a lot of students who really want to participate in the arts, regardless of whether they're a major or not, um, definitely look at us for that element. So about 30% of our students are involved in music and 50% are involved in either music, art, theater, or dance. Um, as I mentioned earlier, there are scholarships, you know, for those students who are interested in being a part of the department to some capacity. Again, you don't have to be a major, um, but we have 18 official ensembles which consists of eight choirs, two bands, two orchestras, and three jazz ensembles, not including our student run like choir, a cappella, handbook choir, et cetera. Uh, we have five theater, formal theater productions every year, one of which is always a musical. Um, we have two art galleries and two different dance companies. So um, that's kind of just a little bit of a brief description of all of that. 
I will keep it short and be on the flip side. Um, in total transparency, the fine arts are not the largest majors at SLU. We do have a music and a theater program and a dance minor, but typically students who are involved in the fine arts are usually involved in it as a passion project because you don't need to be a major or minor to get involved in them. Or students who do major in theater and music also are usually double majoring in something else. We are in the arts district, so and we do have art museums both on and off campus. So there are ways for students to explore the fine arts, but it's not necessarily what SLU is known for. Yeah, and I'll just add for Grinnell, um, I think what I appreciate about the fine arts at Grinnell is that it's available at all different levels. If you're looking to have like a pretty intense fine arts experience and you want to, you know, curate your own kind of um, creative works and work one on one with a professor, you can do that through our mentor advanced projects, which are basically one on one independent studies. But at the same time, if um, you're just looking to pick something up and have some fun playing an instrument, you know, being creative, that's totally available too. I was talking to a current student the other day um, who uh, her goal at her time here at Grinnell is to be able to take accordion lessons one semester and just learn how to play the accordion. Um, so it, it's really whatever you want it to be at Grinnell, you're able to kind of make it. Same here. <laughs> um, we've got, you know, programs that anyone can actually um, either take classes if they don't want to minor or major in dance, if they don't want to major or minor in music, anyone is able to take any of the courses that we offer across the, the board in arts. Um, and I don't want to brag about any of the arts programs, but you know, you can be a great artist in the city of New Orleans as well. <laughs> right, uh, Evan, you have a question? Yeah, so I have 